Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. Well, he said 30 years. That made me feel old in a hurry. It's great to be with your pastor. He has been my friend for a long time, and I thank God for him and for his family. And I thank God for you. I love this church. I always love being here, and I know these are unusual days. But the Lord is at work. You believe that? And you're in the right place this morning. This is a tremendous crowd for the early service, and I want to thank you for coming. And uh, I want to share a thought with you this morning that I hope and pray God will use to encourage your faith. I want you to get your copy of the Word of God and open it with me, if you will, please, in the New Testament to the book of 1 Corinthians. And I want you to come to one of the great chapters. Now, it's all great because it's the Word of God, but it is the classic chapter on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 usually is the chapter we come to on Easter Sunday. And uh, I think every Lord's Day is a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You can't come to 1 Corinthians for chapter 15 on the wrong day because as believers, everything that we trust is rooted in the resurrection. If Jesus Christ is dead and not alive, we're in a mess. But if we have a living Savior, then I tell you we have hope for this life and praise God we have hope for all eternity. That's an amazing chapter. I wish you had time to walk you through it. I hope you'll read it sometime today on your own time. But I want to concentrate on one verse, if I may, this morning. And within the verse, on one word. I'm going to give you a one-word sermon. How many of you would like to hear a one-word sermon? Would you raise your hand? Some of you are saying, praise God. We've been waiting on one of those for a while. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 57. Here's the verse. The Bible says, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's an amazing verse. Matter of fact, let's read it together. Would you read it with me aloud? 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Ready? But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I think you can do better than that. Let's try it again. Ready, everybody? Read it with your heart this time, not just your voice. Here we go. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. See if you can say it without looking at it. Ready? But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm brainwashing you this morning. That's what I'm doing. It's a good brainwashing. It's the word of God. And this is, to me, one of the most encouraging verses in all of the Bible. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you're facing right now. If you can understand, comprehend, apply the victory that God gives through Jesus Christ, you can live with hope in any circumstance. So here's the word. Right in the heart of the verse, I want you to take your pen out if you don't mind and circle the word in verse 57. It is the word victory. Probably one of the greatest celebrations of victory our own nation ever experienced it was in 1945, the World War II came to a climax and a conclusion. My grandfather was a Navy man. He was stationed at Pearl Harbor just after the attack. And he helped with all of the cleanup. And before he died, I had the privilege of going there with him and standing on top of that USS Arizona Memorial. I'll never forget it. And watching, of course, the oil still rising from the depths and standing in front of that massive wall with all the names etched there my grandfather was a farmer and a coal miner he was a, he was a tough man but he stood there and cried i've never forgotten that because there was a generation of americans who paid the ultimate price for victory on may the 8th 1945 something amazing happened in europe and that was the allied forces conquered as a matter of fact, I think one of the most iconic pictures I've ever seen is the picture of Winston Churchill. You've seen the picture with his fingers raised like this. V is for what? Victory. A day later, on May the 9th, uh, in um, the waters outside of Japan, they declared what they called VJ Day, Victory Over Japan Day. That was when the Asian forces then conquered. And uh, in the streets of the cities in America, uh, people were exuberant. If you've ever watched any of the video clips, I mean throngs of people. There was no organization. There was no grassroots movement. It was just the spontaneous response of people who had been in such a battle for so long, under such stress and strain and struggle, 
when victory finally came, they couldn't help themselves. They just took to the streets rejoicing and cheering and singing and uh, the young men kissing the young ladies and uh, they were celebrating on every corner because they had found victory. They thought that would be the war that would bring all of this world conflict to an end. How many of you know that wasn't true? Now I say to you, the great victory is not military. The great victory is not economic. It is not political. It is not social. The great victory is spiritual because watch this. Spiritual victory outlasts this world and it continues into the world to come. May I say, if you're really a Christian, you're on the winning side. That ought to mean something to you. And when you come to a verse like 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 57, it is a reminder that God not only has done something for us, but He is doing something in us at this very moment. 1 Corinthians 15 typically is read at graveside services. I'm certain through the years, hundreds of times, you've opened your Bible to 1 Corinthians 15, stood at an open grave, and read, uh, O grave, where is thy sing? O death, where is thy victory? And we say, oh, you know, this body's coming out of the grave someday because Jesus rose from the dead. And I say amen to that. But I want to submit to you this morning that 1 Corinthians 15 is not a chapter for the dead. It is a chapter for the living. It's not just a chapter for open graves. It is a chapter that opens the truth to us of how to live in a world surrounded by death and decay and disruption, but live with victory on the inside. So what do we learn from this one verse? Well, let's walk through it. You have your Bible still open? Follow me. Look at verse number 57. And notice the first word is important. The Bible says, but. Don't you love it when God butts in? When things are difficult, when things seem hopeless and in despair, and then the Lord says, but. And God suddenly steps into the midst of it all. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve sinned against God. They disobeyed God's law. They sinned against His love, and Satan seemed to have his way. But there was a moment, praise the Lord, that God came walking through that garden. Human, humankind had deteriorated to a point where the imagination of man's heart was only evil continually, but God had a remnant in a Noah and his family and an ark to save them. All of the world lived in darkness and in despair, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent for His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Right on time, Jesus Christ stepped on the page of human history. And I want to tell you that the world may be in a mess right now, but there's coming a moment that Jesus Christ is going to step out of glory onto a cloud, and a trumpet's going to sound, and a voice is going to ring out, and the dead in Christ are going to rise. Jesus Christ is coming again. And because of that, I'm not defeated today. No, I'm living with a consciousness of victory because here's the first great truth I've learned from this verse. It comes from the little word but, and it is this, that victory is possible. The context of the verse is important because in the previous verses, he shows the two worst enemies. Would you like to know what the two worst enemies are if I said, make a list of all your enemies. Go ahead, make a list of all your enemies. Make a list of America's enemies, and you start making a list. I want you to know at the top of the list, you've got to put these two. Back up just a second, and look at verse number 55. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. May I say to you today that the two greatest enemies all of us face are sin and death. You boil it all down, the greatest enemy I have I carry around with me every day. I look at him in the mirror every morning. It's my sin nature on the inside. I battle sin. You battle sin? That's our great enemy. But I want you to know Jesus Christ conquered sin. And ultimately, I battle death. In fact, someday, you know, I'm thinking this body's going to die. Oh, but praise the Lord, Jesus Christ also died. and He rose from the dead alive forevermore. And in doing so, he not only conquered sin, he also conquered death. Hebrews says that he delivered those who through fear of death were all of their lifetime subject to bondage. May I say to you this morning that if Jesus Christ conquered the greatest two enemies you face, what is it in your life you think he cannot conquer now? Why is it we trust him for heaven but not for here? How is it that we think God will be enough to keep us out of hell 
But he's not enough to meet our needs right where we are. No, I say to you, if victory is possible, ultimately then victory is possible today because my victory is not contingent on how I feel or what somebody else can do for me or the circumstances that are staring me in the face. My victory is rooted in one person, and that is Jesus Christ. So come to the end of the verse. If the first word's important, but, and notice how the verse ends. The victory comes, mark it in your Bible, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you write down somewhere, not only is victory possible, victory is in a person. And the person has a name. I love the fact he uses God's full name, our Lord's full name. Look at it at the end of verse number 57. He doesn't say victory through Jesus. He doesn't say victory through the Lord. He doesn't say victory through Christ. He puts the entire full name and title of our Lord together. Victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Every part of that means something. The Lord means that he rules and reigns. I want you to know, you may feel like you're overcome, but Jesus Christ is the overcomer. And look, if God be for us, who can be against us? Who can separate us from the love of Christ? The Lord has made us, Romans chapter 8, more than conquerors through him that loved us. He is the Lord. I've got some good news for you. Anybody else sick of hearing bad news right now? Let me give you some good news this morning. The good news is that Jesus Christ is where he's always been. He's seated on the throne of the universe. Now, at this moment, he's ruling and reigning. He has everything under control. He has his eye on you, every hair of your head numbered. He knows you by name. He remembers that you are dust, and his grace is more than enough. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's not only the Lord, he's the Lord Jesus. And Jesus is his earthly name, the name of his humility and his humanity. It is the name that means Savior. It is the name that reminds me that God is not a million miles away, but God became a man without ceasing to be God. That we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. That God understands exactly what you're dealing with, because God literally came to earth and inhabited a body and dealt with the very same things you and I are dealing with at this moment. Victory is in the person of the Lord Jesus. And then ultimately, victory is in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the word Christ is the same word as the word Messiah. It means anointed one. Look, please. He has a purpose, and he has a plan, and he has a program. And I tell you, I don't care what the devil does. I don't care what governments do. I don't care what the world says. He is going to fulfill everything that he promised. The Bible says it is impossible for God to lie. And on the authority of the word of God today, I want to tell you, if you're looking for victory, stop looking at men and look to Jesus. If you're looking for victory, stop looking to yourself and look to Jesus. If you're looking for victory, stop looking to some government to break through and realize this, that the great ruler is our king, the Lord Jesus Christ. Look to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I love this thought. Did you notice the little possessive pronoun here? He does not say victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at, look at your Bible. What does it say? Victory through what? Oh, I like that. It's not just his personal name, but now he's dealing with our personal relationship. I'm testifying now. I'm not preaching. I'm testifying. I am grateful this morning that he is not just the Lord, the Jesus, the Christ. No, I'm grateful today he is my Lord. He is my Jesus. He is my Christ. I don't just know about him. I know him. I, I, I don't just have some casual relation with him. No, I have fellowship with him. He lives inside of me. You want victory today? I'm going to tell you what you need. You need to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You need to make sure that you've repented of your sin and by faith received the Lord Jesus Christ and allowed him to sit on the throne of your heart. And if you have, I'm speaking to a lot of believers this morning, if you have, then I want to say to you in the words of the old hymn writer, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. You see, he's the victor, and he's not just the victor. He's my victor. He is my conqueror. Revelation chapter 1, he says, I am he that was dead and am alive, and behold, I am alive forevermore and have the keys of death, hell, and the grave. I love this. When the Lord Jesus Christ came out of the grave, 
He conquered sin and death. And when he left this world and went back to glory, he had the keys in his hand. Don't you know keys represent power? Look, please. He has all authority. He has all access. He has given me the assurance. He holds the keys of the universe and the title deed of the world. And when the Lord Jesus went through the door of heaven, I'm glad to report to you this morning, he left the door open behind him. And he made a way that you and I could go boldly into the presence of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Is he your Lord Jesus Christ? Nothing more sweet or precious to me in all the world than to say, Tammy is my wife. Morgan and Lauren and Grant, they are my children. Humanly speaking, it's the most tender expression I could possibly give. Oh, but there is one greater than that. It is when I say, he is my Lord Jesus Christ. There's victory in the person of Christ. Look at our verse again. The Bible says, But thanks be to God which giveth us. Do you see that little word giveth? It's an amazing word. We understand what it means, but did you know there's an actual tense in the word that's used here? I like this. It is not a past tense word, and it is not a future tense word. It is a present tense word it literally means like this but thanks be unto god which just keeps on giving and giving and giving and giving us victory through our lord jesus christ and i say to you this morning that victory is not only possible and victory is in a person but victory is present it is a present tense victory because our god is a present tense god he is, the psalmist said, a very present help in time of trouble. He, he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He's the one who said, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Moses said, I need to know your name, Lord. They're going to ask me what your name is. And God said, just tell them this. Tell them, I am that I am. I have to say I am and put something after, but God doesn't. He just says I am, period, because he is the self-sufficient, self-existent, eternal one. He is the great I am. He is not I was and he is not I will be. He is I am at this moment. And I want to say to you this morning, rejoice in past victories. We've all had them. Thank God for them. But you can't live on past victories. And look forward to future victory, ultimate victory. A new body. Anybody else looking forward to getting a new body someday when we get to heaven? Looking forward to the devil being shut up forever and this world being what God intended from the beginning? I'm looking forward to ultimate victory. But I say to you today that the God of victory is present at this moment and he offers us a present tense victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we come to the great application of the verse. Did you notice it? How? <laughs> One thing for me to explain it, you just sit there and nod your head or mark something in your Bible or take a note and say, yeah, I believe that, but how? Isn't that the great struggle? How to live in that victory, the verse tells us. What's the second word of the verse, church? But what? Hmm. Thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. May I, may I say to you this morning that victory is found as we praise Him. There's a whole lot of people praying right now. A lot of people begging God for health, begging God for assistance, begging God for revival, begging God for you fill in the blank. What is the thing you're begging God for? And I'm not suggesting we let up on that at all. But I am suggesting that if you want to live in victory, you can't just be asking all the time. There must be some adoring in it too. That as surely as there's power in prayer, there's power in praise. Do you know why there's power in praise? There's power in praise. Because that's where God lives. Somebody says, what's God's address? And somebody says, my heart. Good. Somebody else says, heaven. True. And let me tell you what God says. God says he inhabits the praises of his people. Would you like to know where the Lord is right now? The Lord's presence is most manifest in the heart that is full of praise for God. Here's what I've discovered. I've discovered that when I start praising God, something happens. Something happens. Now, the Lord is always near. He is is ever near. But something happens inside of me. Suddenly, I am ushered into consciously the presence of my God. I think it's what the psalmist meant when he wrote, we come into his presence with singing, into his courts with praise. Be, Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Do you remember when the children of Israel conquered Canaan? When God gave them finally the ultimate victory and they go marching in, Well, before they went into the land of Canaan, read it for yourself sometime. They said, Lord, we want to know which tribe should go in first. Anybody know which tribe went in first? 
There was one tribe of all the tribes that was allowed to go in first. And God is the one who said which tribe got to go in first. It was the tribe of Judah. Now that's important for a couple reasons. One, because Judah was the tribe of whom our Lord Jesus would come. Remember, Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Hey, I like this. Jesus is the one who leads the charge into victory. But do you know what Judah's name means? Judah's name means praise. I, I love this concept. Watch, please. How did, they, how did they conquer Canaan? Through their own might and power? Through their own ingenuity and ideas? Through their own strength and wit? God forbid that we think that any victory is won that way. They conquered Canaan and they went in praising the Lord. And I want to say to you that at this juncture, God's people ought not live with their heads down. We ought to live with our heads up. I'm not going down, friend. I'm going up very shortly. I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for Christ. I'm not living in despair today. I'm looking to the Lord. Lift up your head. Your redemption draweth nigh. And I'm going to tell you what God's people ought to be doing right now. They ought to be praising their way through this mess. Somebody said, how did you get through that pandemic? Or how did you get through that economic time? Or how did you get through all the strife in your nation? I'm going to tell you how God's people get through it. They go through praising the Lord as they go through. And that's why this verse says, but thanks be unto God. I wish I had time to show you in the book of Chronicles, but there was a day that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, was going out to war. He was leading his troops into a massive battle. Massive. Frankly, he was outnumbered. He was outgamed. He was in trouble. You know what he did? He got a whole group of the children of Israel together, and he said, I'm going to give you all a big job. All right, king, we're ready. What's this military strategy you have for us? Jehoshaphat said, you all have one job. The only job you have is I want you to sing and praise God the whole time we're fighting. What? That's right. Y'all are the praisers. You're going to lead the charge in the battle. Can you imagine how silly that must have looked? The worshipers are going in first. But that was their job. I was looking at it again this weekend. Oh, it's glorious. The Bible says that when they began to sing and praise, God set an ambushment for the enemy. Watch this. Jehoshaphat didn't win the battle. God won the battle. The people didn't overtake their enemies. God gave them the victory. And when did he do it? When they started praising and worshiping God. See, the victory's not after the battle, church. The victory's in the midst of the battle. Sing your way through the storm. Praise your way through the problem. Worship your way through the warfare. God will be enough, and His power will be demonstrated when His people start to truly praise Him. Let me prove it. You still got your Bible open? Go back to Romans 7 real quick, very, very fast. Go back a few pages in your Bible to Romans 7. Romans 7 is, is a chapter of fleshly warfare struggling with the old man and battling sin you want me to prove it paul who's the greatest christian that ever lived wrote in romans 7 verse 24 oh wretched man that i am you ever feel that way oh lord what's wrong with me dear god why do i keep sinning like this oh father i told you i wouldn't do that again oh wretched man that i am who shall deliver me from the body of this death now, if it stopped right there, it'd be pretty depressing, wouldn't it? Read the next verse, church. I, what's the next word? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sounds to me like the turning point was when he stopped looking at him and started looking at him. It sounds to me like the turning point was when he stopped getting so fixated on his inability and started thinking about God's ability. Yes, you're weak, but God's strong. Yes, you're a sinner, but God's merciful. Yes, we're all ignorant at times, but God is wise. Yes, we get troubled, but God is peace. I'm saying to you that whatever lack you have, God is more than enough. Why don't you stop belly aching and moaning and begroaning what you don't have and start thinking about what you do have in Jesus Christ and thank God for it? Let me show it to you one more time. Go back over to 2 Corinthians just a minute. Literally just a couple pages away from our text. Come to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And look at verse number 13. Paul's having a hard time. As a matter of fact, so much that in 2 Corinthians 2.13, he said, I had no rest in my spirit. 
That describes a whole lot of people I know right now. Restless. Can't sleep. Having a hard time. No rest in my spirit because I found not Titus my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. And look at verse 14. Oh, I love this. Now, thanks. There's that word again. Thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. And maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. If I had to put a sign next to that verse, it'd be this sign. It'd be, it'd be victory. He always calls with us to triumph in Jesus Christ. May I say to you, it really is not this for victory. It is this for victory. The cross of Jesus Christ and the empty tomb is what provides our victory. And it works every day, not just on Sunday. And it works in every circumstance, not just when you're up. And it works when you're not feeling good. And it works when you're troubled. And it works when America is upside down. Watch this, please. Because our victory is rooted in the person of Jesus Christ. And he is the one who makes it possible at every moment. A young man years ago came into my office and he said, Brother Scott, he said, I'm struggling. I'm really struggling. And I said, what are you struggling with? He said, I'm struggling with doubts about my salvation. He said, I know I've been saved. I know I've been saved. He told me all about his conversion, how he came to Christ. And he said, I know that I'm a Christian. He said, but I keep getting plagued with these doubts. And he said, he said, I know it's the devil. And he told me why. And he said, all these dark thoughts come and all these question marks come. And he said, so then I just get to feeling guilty. And so I just say to God again, oh, God, save me. He said, I've prayed hundreds of times that God would save me. I just keep asking God to save me over and over and over again as if God didn't hear me the first time. I said to my young friend, I'm going to give you a piece of advice. I want you to go home and do something different this week. Every time that doubt and that question mark comes, instead of asking God to save you, I want you to stop right then and there and thank God that he did save you. In other words, every time the doubt comes and the darkness comes, instead of, instead of giving way to that, turn that thing around into praise and just stop and say, Lord, I want to pause and just give you praise and glory that Jesus is enough and you saved my soul and you always keep your word. It was the turning point for that young man to bring him to victory. And I want to say to some of God's people today who've been asking and asking and worrying and fretting that maybe the turning point for us will be when we begin to praise God again and give Him thanks, not just that He has, not just that He will, but that He is at this moment. Thanks be unto God which giveth us the victory and goes on giving us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ.